Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're going to explore the revolutionary communes of Orenburg. For the denizens of the southern Urals, the temporary triumph of the Burgundian system was all the proof needed that dudism is too dangerous for the mere peasant communes to overcome. Indeed, instead, the workers and peasants must unite under a collective will of iron, armed to the teeth and ready for battle. Thankfully, there is a particular brand of Bolshevism that thought along similar lines already, one that is been eagerly spread with zeal by former party men from TMM. Mikhail Parvukin, a former disciple of Kaganovich, has taken command of the lands of Orenburg and has begun the process of reshaping Orenburg itself to resist the dudist invader, one that shall suffer under the uh, suffer the Tsarist and reactionary not to live. And here we are, my friends, with the unique unique flag under Parvukin. Cool. Green and steel. The Bolshevik coup in the southern Urals had been weeks in the making. No sooner had the earliest rumors of Taborutsky's death reached Mikhail Parvukin's hideout in the mountains that, than he set about preparing for the expulsion of Orenburg's isolated garrison. When it came, it was but a mere formality, with the Imperials scattering at the first sight of an organized attack. General Secretary Parvukin, henceforth the competent authority in the area which long ago had belonged to the eponymous anarchist council, quickly endeared himself to the local population by overseeing the liquidation, or liquidation of Daddy Tabby's original couples. He knew well enough, however, that the task of government would be far more unpleasant. Imperial rule had been particularly unkind to the Urals, or the Southern Urals. The fields which were not merely follow lay poisoned. The factories that had not been entirely stripped and had suffered some form of ruination. Internal commerce was non-existent, and an effective bureaucracy that never existed in the first place, Pervukin sighed. Looking over the map of the Southern Urals, kindly left at Government House by its deceased prior occupant, the General Secretary grimaced. It was almost an ancient map by this stage, produced during the later days of the Soviet rule, as marked by the CCCP watermark on its legend. That in and of itself was a reminder to the achievements of Bolshevik civilization. What little remained of a functional society could be traced back to the achievements of the Union alone. <clears throat> Barukin's mind harkened back to the days of 1918 and 21. Was Russia then no less savaged by reaction than it was now? Did the Bolshevik spirit incarnate in Lenin, Kaganovich, and Stalin not suffice to overcome the penury of Russia's situation then? If those men had set, managed to thrust the vastness of the motherland into modernity, then he could put, put the pseudo Makonite peasantry of a few oblasts back on the right track. That feat could be accomplished only through the methods of his mentors. Material balance, planning, democratic centralism, and a strong red army were the correct ways to run a state whether the uppity music liked it or not. For the part, the anarchists should be content that after the demonstrated failure of their fantasy government, he was benevolent enough to allow their existence to be reflected in the country's new name. All revolutionary communes of Orenburg did have a nice appeal to them after all. Even if there were no communes, democratic centralism and electrical engineer equals Communism, and we have the national spirits, land, new land of iron, very cool for construction speed and efficiency growth, as well as the final revolution, we lose a lot of stability in exchange for a lot of ideology of defense, and of course a tasty, tasty, salted earth. <laughs> the fifth marks. The dire situation in Greater Orenburg had necessitated the revival of the term Schmetz, now applicable to a large number of former Ural League officers in the service of the Commune's Red Army, with political commissars by their side, a handful of poor rifle slave men underneath, and their close relatives under Chekhov watch. These men became Perkovukin's military backbone. Apart from the few raids by Kazakh purifiers in the south, however, the Ural's Red Army was often more preoccupied with the internal enemies of the revolution than those on the outside initially. This was taken to mean what few sympathizers that Taboritsky, Taboritsky regime had had in Orenburg, or what few local bourgeois organized to resist the expropriation of their factories nowadays, however. The term invariably described the anarchist peasantry, which had taken offense not only to the policies of the revolutionary government, but to the general secretary himself. So far for his part, Captain Lukomsky, Lukomsky did not much blame the peasants. No sooner had the red flags been raised over Orenburg than particularly pervasive, sometimes even cartoonish, depictions of Mikhail Parvukin, whether in print or stone, became a staple of life in the communes. The cause of this particular unrest was a replacement of a statue in memory of the Orenburg's Workers' Council, with one of Parvukin, which depicted him standing right beside Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, and Lazar Kaganovich. Lukomsky thought it gross, and the peasants' distaste for it justified. But if, his t but if his time in the Ural League's army had taught him anything, it was that orders were orders. Fire the three dozen Red Army men under his command opened up on the music mob, as had by now become customary. 
The cold, miserable winter weather made the scene even more dreadful as Lukomsky struggled to clear his nose while kicking away the bodies of anarchists which had fallen out of the side of the statue they had attempted to topple. From their particular homes of the godforsaken village, the political commissar and his chosen few brought back seized anarchist memorabilia to use as firewood. Black flags, devi deviationist literature, pornography, all these it was decreed, should burn at the altar of the general secretary, and so they did. If Lenin himself had to liquidate 20,000 anarchists, imagine what we'd have to do. One party state, we have secularism, we have naturalization for immigration. Give me or give me your poor for refugees and support a disenfranchisement. No, one year draft, which is kind of weird, and racial integration. Cool. <clears throat> Torched. And the particularly fanatical strain of Bolshevism, which sat at the helm of the Euro Revolution, needed any excuse to deem the Orthodox Church irredeemable. Tabritsky's regime had provided it. This time, Red Russia would take no chances. The musique, uh, anarchists had been too weak, or perhaps too high on the opiate of the gospel, to do what was necessary. That was not so with the NKVD, whose list of clergymen, Tabaritskyite, or otherwise, had been steadily growing since the first few scraps of graffiti pen kill lists redacted in the Bolshevik serial hideouts. To Vasily Alexandrovich Petrov, the task was not particularly pleasant. Growing up during the First World War era, religion had been present in his home, said so killing one's childhood is never easy. Nevertheless, in the institution's collaboration with Daddy Tabby condemned it even in Petrov's eyes, and so, he led his men, a dozen men, into the temple, pushing away the few raggedly dressed priests who pleaded to prevent a ransacking. If only they fought this hard against Daddy Tabby, Petrov's political officer let out a laugh as he demeaned a bearded man, clinging on to a Bible. Most of the company laughed ever so uneasily with him as the butt of a Kalashnikov left the old man lying on the ground, the rest of the platoon. Outside the church, fired off a warning shot at the a local rabbi, which had not taken so long to notice what the Bible was being set up for. While some, it should be said, were apathetic to the forcible seizure of holy books, as they were by this point to almost anything. The majority of people attempted some form of protest, but the Rav had orders to deal with deal with those by shooting, but he chose a more sensible approach. Not like the protestations would change anything anyways. Light them up! Light them up with limited safety regulations, public health care, few pollution regulations, public education, outlawed women in the workplace, equal rights, data cohesion. Cool. A 12-hour workday, trinket minimum wage, elite tax exemptions, very cool. Counting costs, though. Ilya's hoe struck the sore, but it was sick. He knew, but at the same time, he wanted to pretend like the festering rot did not exist. Everyone else pretended, and everyone else knew, too. The dark clouds, a permanent testament to their fate, perhaps God's judgment to some loomed over the collective farm almost every day. When he raised his hoe again and felt the poisoned earth, he breathed out something in annoyance, just maybe perhaps a, a curse word. He wasn't sure of himself. Then, just as soon as he spoke, he heard a voice of Mikhail next to him, amidst the many other farmers nearby. Irritated are you now, Ilya? he asked. Ilya heard, but both men continued working, as stopping was not an option. This is the sweat and blood. Mikhail took a sharp breath. That'll be necessary for the spirit of communism to return, you know. Again, with a revolution farce, Ilya sighed, and he could feel Mikhail become a little annoyed. He was a determined Bolshevik, that much Ilya knew, and when he found some satisfaction under Bukharin, he hated the communes and then welcomed Bukim. We're supposed to t till this soil and make it arable in the span of two months. How in God's name are we supposed to do that? I can't say for sure, but a duty is a duty, Mikhail responded, voice ragged and determined. I happily turned over my farmland to the government to do this, and I would not want to see the fruits of my labor unreaped. And another strike, another breath. What happens if we don't meet it? You see how Pervukin treats the anarchists. What if we fail the quota? What if we meet the anarchists or traitors, Mikhail hissed. Hissed, his voice turning cold, but Ilya knew the old Bolshevik had some uncertainty to his tone. He knew many of them, as acquaintances, as friends even. And besides, have you looked around us? Have you even seen what this world is like? And Mikhail's voice grew haggard. If Pervukin's revolution falters, what else do you turn to? But here in society, we're improving our academic base, re research facilities, agriculture output, Industrial equipment, quite a bit for industrial expertise, and even army professionalism. While well, poverty is stagnant as well as our nuclear stockpiles, but the iron foundry. The ceremony had been carefully choreographed to evoke the aesthetics of the October Revolution. While it may have been seen as excessive and demonstrative of the exaltation of industry to hold the opening of an agricultural tools factory much esteem, it truly was deserving of the importance. Daddy Tabby's reign of terror had so thoroughly ransacked the southern Urals that the construction of even such a basic industry had become a groundbreaking event worthy of celebration and a Red Army parade. The General Secretary was, of course, present for the opening of the MG. Provokin agricultural tooling of a factory as were the people's commissars for foreign affairs, labor, industry, and agriculture. The 
The leader here was not alone, however, with the People's Commissars for Military Affairs, Communications, Justice, and Education also in attendance. There are a few important military figures. Alongside what few technicians were available, all there was to celebrate this great achievement of reborn Russian socialism. One group who shined through their absence, however, were the workers themselves. Indeed, all workers with the technical skill to operate industrial machinery were over the mountains and far away, busily toiling in the collectivized farms. The food situation in the cities was so dire that they could hardly be spared for industrial production, so they would be double whammied at any rate. Thus, Secretary Provutkin had devised a solution which would be beneficial to all. What few members of the disposed government had not been executed, alongside the detained anarchist intellectuals and Kazakhs taken prisoners during the frontier battles, all had long sat at Chekka camps, consuming the proletariat's food. Now, however, they would have to provide redemptive labor for it, which, with reduced rations, of course, only fear in the face of the worsening agricultural crisis. Surely, these actions might be retroactively considered excessive, but as far as Pervukin was concerned, they were just and necessary. When Russia was once more found itself united and prospering under the Red Banner, it would, it would be this factory they could trace national redemption to. History will absolve me. But if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.